Well, this morning I want to start in Matthew chapter 5. And I want to talk about how Jesus heals in response to our faith. Jesus heals in response to our faith. And I love this story. This is one of my favorite stories in uh, the Gospels. I'm just going to read through it, and we're going to talk about it this morning, because I think there's a lot of principle we can draw from this, okay? So it says here, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. And then the leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little, my little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she may live. Now, she's dying. She's, she's at the end of her life. We don't know what's wrong, but she's very sick. And he comes pleading at the feet of Jesus. Can you come right away? So, of course, Jesus, full of compassion, in verse 24, says he went with him. All the people follow, crowding around him. And a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. Okay? For 12 years she's been suffering. And all of a sudden, she's going to come and interrupt this procession to go see Jairus' daughter. Do you see this? So what happens is she's been suffering for 12 years with constant bleeding. Now, numbers are really, really important to God. How many know in Hebrew the numbers have meanings, okay? The number 11, okay, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it in Hebrew because I'll mess it up, okay? (laughs) It occurs several times and actually means disorder, imperfection, incompleteness. If she would have came to Jesus in the 11th year, you see, in in her 11th year, she was incomplete. She was in a place of imperfection. There was disorder in her life, but she came on the 12th year of her suffering. Eleven, actually, we see that Judas betrayed Jesus. After Judas betrayed Jesus, there was only eleven disciples. How many know there was disorder? And they said, we need to have twelve. Twelve is the number of government. So we had, Jesus picked twelve, so they cast lots. They had two other p- people come in for the position. They cast lots. They chose a new disciple, so there was twelve. How many know that story? Okay. Um, but but the, the, the number 12 actually means governmental perfection, and it symbolizes God's power and God's authority. What she didn't know was she was suffering for 12 years, but on the 12th year, God's governmental authority, God's power and authority was going to meet her that day. In the 12th year of her suffering. How many know God's, God, God's numbers mean a lot to God? Amen? Amen? We know that Jacob had 12 sons, each of whom became the founder uh, of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Numbers are important to God. All right, God selected 12 men to conduct a census of the tribes in Numbers chapter uh, 1, verse 2 to 16. There was 12 princes of Israel that brought gifts over 12 days to the sanctuary. Jacob had 12 sons, each of whom became a founder. I've already read that. God selected 12 men to conduct a census of the tribes, and you can go on and on and on. And then God finally chose 12 men to carry the gospel to the New Testament church. And so here she is in her 12th year, and God and the number's there to just kind of show us something. Because if you were Jewish, you were Hebrew, you're reading this, you're saying 12. It's a year of completeness. It's God's governmental authority. Something's going to happen in the 12th year. And so let's read on in the story. She'd suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she'd only gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. And here's the key, verse 28. For she thought to herself, and some translation says she determined in her heart, if I can just touch the robe, I will be healed. So immediately when she touched his robe, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible disease. Verse 30, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched me? Now, the disciples all of a sudden look to Jesus in the next verse and say, Jesus, you're famous. 
everybody is touching you. Everybody is rubbing up against you. Everybody's trying to get a piece of you. What do you mean? How, how, what are you talking about who, who touched you? But Jesus said, okay, he kept looking around to see who had done it. And then this frightened woman, trembling, she realized of what had happened to her, came and fell down on her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith, say your faith, your faith. has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Now, here's the thing. All faith really is is expectation. And so you have all these people, including the disciples, who are walking with Jesus, and they're in his presence all the time. They're seeing the miracles. They're seeing all this stuff happen around them. They're in his presence, but there's no expectation. But here comes a woman who all of a sudden has an expectation on the anointing. The Bible says that he was anointed to set the captives free. The anointing is to set the captives free. Say, set the captives free. Set the captives free. Okay? It's to cause liberty to come. It's to cause blind eyes to open. There's a purpose for the presence and the anointing of God. Amen. But if we're not careful, we can get in the presence of God from week to week, and we do this like, I really felt God's presence today. That's a good thing. How many love it when the worship team does worship and we come and we just say, something's different in the atmosphere. I feel love. I feel joy. I'm at peace. You know, it's good. God's presence is here. But how many know God's presence has a purpose? And, and what happens as a people, uh, if we're not careful, we stop coming into his presence with expectation. We need to be coming to church. We need to be coming to our knees in our devotion time, where, however we spend time with God. We have to come with a spirit of ex expectation. We have to be like this woman who says, I'm determining in my heart that when I touch the hem of his garment, when I get in the presence of God, my breakthrough is going to come. Because the Bible teaches that without faith, it's impossible, say impossible, impossible. to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he exists. And every one of us believes, for here we probably believe he exists, number one. But number two, we have to believe that he, will, he wants to reward those who diligently seek him. How many here have diligently sought the Lord? Well, God wants to reward you. And Jesus said this, he says, you, you have not because you ask not. Ask that your joy may be full. So sometimes we're afraid to ask God for the things we need, uh, and, and we have no expectation. How, how many hear what I'm saying? And I don't speak this word to discourage people. That, I don't want you to think I don't have enough faith, but I want you to realize that your faith will grow. The Bible says that we each have been given a measure of faith. And as we meditate on the word, as we spend time in the scripture, as we spend time in his presence, our faith begins to grow. And suddenly you find yourself walking with God and believing God for the impossible. But it starts with allowing your faith to grow by getting in the word. Because faith only comes by the hearing of God's word. Amen? I know I shared a story with the men at the men's breakfast. So some of you have to hear it a second time. But when I was in Kingston... I was, uh, we moved to Kingston from Trenton, started a church, and I was working in Maydock. The only job I could find was in Maydock. It was an hour and a half away. So I would travel back and forth, and I had two kids, had a mortgage payment. And the job wasn't working out, so I had to quit that job because I had got another job, but I took the new job, and then I lost that job in two weeks because the guy couldn't keep the company going and yada, yada, right? It was a big issue. But I had been looking through Kingston. I said, I, I need to find a job in Kingston. So I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I handed out resumes. Do you remember, Camilla? Couldn't find a job. I got a mortgage payment and two kids. And I'm saying, what am I going to do? So we're driving down the road, and this is my twilight zone moment. You want to hear this? This is a twilight, mom twilight zone moment for me. It was really freaky because we see this little sign in front of this little church saying, revival meeting tonight. And had this old gentleman's name on there. He, he, I forget his name, but he was from Kenneth Hagin's ministry. And had been, he's probably in his 80s. 
So he'd been in the Word a long time. So we'd say, okay, we're going to go to this meeting. So we, we decided to go to the meeting. Just felt we had to be there. So we go to the meeting, and he's talking about faith. And he said, you know, down in the States, uh, he said there was, a, there was a, I think it was in Texas or something, there was, there was this drought 30 years ago. There was, I forget the time, but it was a while ago. There was this big drought, and, and, and uh, the farmer's crops were failing. There was, there was no water to drink. It was, like, really, really bad. And so the community decided to have a prayer meeting. And he said uh, all the people in the community came to the prayer meeting, and uh, they came out in the field to pray. And this one old lady, she got out of her car, and she had an umbrella with her. <laughs> and as she walked to the center of the field, everyone was looking at her like, what's wrong with you? She goes, well, I am believing God's going to answer my prayer today. Amen. See, she came with a spirit of expectation. The Bible says faith without works is dead. So if you're believing God for something, you've got to put your faith to it. You've got to say, I believe in you, God, and, and you put your faith to it. You've got you to act as if God's going to answer you. Amen. And so she came with her umbrella, and they, some people were kind of laughing at her and stuff, but they prayed, and before they got back to their cars, it started raining, and she was the only one who stayed dry. <laughs> because she came with a spirit of expectation. And so what I want to do today is I want to encourage you to... Uh, to come back to that place where when we come in the presence of God, it's not just to enjoy his presence as, much, as enjoyable as it is, but it's to come with a spirit of expectation. That it's saying, if I, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be healed. If I can only touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch God, he's going to answer my prayer, and my marriage is going to be restored. God, you're going to, you're going to settle that situation at work. Uh, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to fix these problems in my life. And I just know that I can come boldly before the throne of grace in my time of need to obtain mercy and to obtain grace for, for, for the situations I have to deal. And we have to come with the spirit of expectation if we want to get the blessing of heaven in our life. Amen. So I haven't even got to the, the freaky part. Here's the freaky part. So the old guy's preaching, and he says, I, I have faith. I have a gift of faith on my life. I spent many times in the year, and the Lord has blessed me. And he was a very humble man. He didn't, he didn't come across cocky at all. He just said, I just really have this gift of faith in my life that the Lord has imparted to me. And he goes, I really feel right now. He said, there's people in this audience. He goes, I want you to just come before the Lord in your mind and ask God for two things. Okay, that you need from him. And I just want you to tell God, Father, I need this from you. And then I want you to come up, and I'm going to pray for you. And he said, within 24 hours, my God will answer those prayers. Now, it's important to say this, because everything needs to be in balance. Say balance. Okay? Everything we ask of God according to his will. So if you ask for something, you can go ahead and ask for it. If it's not his will, you're not going to get it anyway. So... But here, here I am in the, in the congregation, so I'm saying two things. What do I need? Well, when I had lost my job, my boss owed me two weeks' pay. And I needed a new job. I said, God, I want that paycheck. I want to pay my mortgage this month, and I really need a new job. So the, the, the preacher said, okay, you've had your time now. He goes, when you come up, I'm going to lay hands and pray a prayer of faith. And then within 24 hours, God's going to answer your prayer. Now, I'm, I'm not believing this at the time. I'm sitting there going, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but he said, I, he says, I'm going to give, I'm going to, you can ride on my faith coattails, okay? I'm just going to believe for you because you don't believe yourself. Come forward. So, so I go forward. He comes and he just prays for everybody. And then we go home. Do you remember that? So the next day, I get a knock at the door. And it's a Christian businessman in the community who had already turned me down, just didn't, didn't need me for work, but he showed up, and he said, hey, he said, I think the Lord spoke to me, I'm supposed to hire you, how much do you need an hour? So we talked about it, and he agreed, he said, okay, you got a job starting Monday, and I'm sitting there just like shaking, going, freaky, this is really freaky to me. <laughs> See, whatsoever you ask for when you pray, whatever you say, whatever you ask for when you pray, believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. God wanted me to have a job. God wanted me to pay my mortgage. And so I'm riding on this guy's faith coattails. 
And I'm sitting there going, okay, now I've got a job. This is really awesome. So then he's leaving, and he, he goes, oh, by the way, he turned around, he goes, God also spoke to me. I'm supposed to write you a check just to bless you, some extra money. He gave me a check, and it was for the amount that I was owed from my previous employer. Now, isn't that awesome? And I'm sitting there just shaking because, see, the, the reality is you take sometimes, okay, how many know some, some, sometimes in the faith movement, I'm just going to talk real with you, um, people have got into extremes and it got into error. How many know what I'm saying? So, so the, the temptation is, as a church is we throw out the baby with the bathwater. Well, I don't want to talk about faith and believing God for certain things because then I'm part of the, the faith movement. No, don't, don't, be, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Jesus said, whatever you ask for when you pray, Believe that you receive it, and you shall have it. And if you have anything against your brother, unforgiveness in your heart, go and make that right first, and God will, God will do it for you. Isn't that good news? And so, so we, we need to come with expectation. We have to come to God believing that we'll receive, and then we'll have it. Because if we don't, it says in James chapter 1, uh, you know, if you come to God and ask for wisdom, but you, you, uh, you don't believe it in your heart, you're double-minded in all your ways. And, and then he goes to say, you won't receive anything from God. You have to, you single, I'm trusting you, God. And I don't have the faith to say, I'm going to pray for you and God's going to do it in 24 hours. This old guy did, but I wouldn't say that. But I do have the faith to say that if you believe God in his timing, if it's according to his will, you will receive it. And we have to come with that kind of expectation. Because God wants to diligently, he wants us to diligently reward us as we diligently seek him. Amen? Amen. So, I want to just share a couple truths with you this morning. Um, The first truth is this. The church, say I'm part of the church, church. is an equipping body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 4 to 7. If we can bring that passage up. <clears throat> there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. You and I have the same Holy Spirit working in our lives. Right? Next verse. Yeah, keep going. <clears throat> there are different kinds of services, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. And verse 7 is very, very important. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. That's, that's what it is. A spiritual gift that God likes to use me in uh, is the word of knowledge. God shows me things about people. But that, that's, not, that's not my gift. That's your gift that God uses through me. We have to see that the gifts that you operate in are gifts that God flows through you to others. Our gifts and our talents and our abilities and our spiritual gifts are to help one another. Amen? And so we are an equipped body. The second thing is, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 13 says this, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. You're part of the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we have all been baptized, immersed into one body by the Spirit, and we all share, say we all share, the same Spirit. We all have the same Spirit. Okay, isn't that awesome? And so... That's the second truth. Truth number two, we are God's priests. Say, I'm God's priest. First Peter 5, 6 says, And you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. What more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God, as the scripture says, I'm placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. So God has called us to be kings and priests. Do you know what a priest was able to go into the presence of God? A priest was able to 
Specifically, the high priest could go right into the Holy of Holies. They had access to the temple of God. So, so God has made you a priest. You can go into the presence of God any time. But here's the thing. You don't go in just to have a good time and fall on the floor and laugh. And Those things are okay, but you go into the presence of God so that you can acquire what you need from God for the mission he's given you on the earth. Amen? Amen? For God has called you to be a priest for him. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 11 says, But you are not like that. He's talking about uh, people that are not serving the Lord. He says, You are a chosen people. Say, I'm a chosen people. You are a royal priest. Holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I mean, this is good news. Once you had no identity as people, now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. And so the enemy would come to put thoughts in your mind that you're just a worm and you're never going to overcome and you don't have the ability to break these addictions and you just, you'll just never change. And you say, no, no, no. The Bible says that I am a royal priesthood. That I can go into the presence of God anytime I need to and I can get from God what I need for the breakthrough I need tomorrow. How many hear what I'm saying? You know, I didn't have mercy before, devil, but today I have mercy. I've received it because of the finished work of the cross. So I'm not going to listen to your lies anymore. And, and we're, so, we're so quick to listen to the lies. That's why we need to get in the word and say, what does God say about me? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. We have a high priest who understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Like, think about it. All the times that we were tempted and we messed up. Jesus understands. Jesus walked on the earth. He, he, he was tempted to sin, but he didn't. He overcame. But he understands what it's like to be under temptation. He, 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 he understands. Okay? Next verse, it says here, So let us come boldly, to the throne of our gracious God, there we will receive his mercy, we will find grace. What are we going to find at his throne? And, and to help us when we need it most. And so what the enemy wants to do is when you get discouraged, it's usually through thoughts, negative thoughts, or through people that are just the enemy speaking through them, you know, and, and saying negative things about you, and you feel like you've been beat up, you've been knocked out, you're laying on the, tar you're laying on the, on the ground, and, and God is saying, no, get up. Come into my throne room. Look at what I have to say about you. And then you keep fighting. Don't give up. Because you're a royal priesthood. And in yourself, you can't do it. But if you come into my presence because you're a priest and you have access to my presence, I'll empower you for a breakthrough. Amen? Amen? So, let's look at a couple more scriptures here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. I love this. One of my favorite, favorite verses in the Bible. And I've lost my, my new King James Bible got lost. And so now I have a new living translation that I'm reading for a little bit. And then I'm going to go back to my new King James. Um, but it's almost refreshing to read it in a new translation because most of these scriptures I've got memorized. And then when I read them in a new translation, I'm like, wow, it just hits me in another angle. Amen? But listen to this here. But God is so rich in mercy, and his, he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. So you're a joint heir with Christ. Jesus has authority over every demonic principality is under his foot. But you're seated with him in that same realm of authority. Chew on that. Think about that. All right? Like you're seated with Christ in that place of authority that when the enemy comes against your life, you can just wave your finger and you can say, no devil. And you, can, you have authority. The same authority Jesus has, you have it because... You're part of him. You're seated with him. You're a, co a joint heir with Christ Jesus. Co-heir. 
Think about it. We don't sometimes, right? And so look what it says here in, um, in verse 10. This is really good. For we are God's masterpiece. Did you know you're a masterpiece? If you ever go to see an artist, you go to an art, an art museum or something, and, and they'll show you the art. Like this, this is nice. You know, this is worth $2 million and this is worth 300000 Like These are special pieces. But this here, this is a masterpiece. This, this is a, you know, what's the name of the, 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 the girl with the frown there? What's her name there? Mona Lisa, yeah. For whatever reason, that is a masterpiece, right? And, and God looks at that. It, there's so much value. Uh, he created you and knew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good works that he planned for us to do long ago. I want you to say with me, I'm God's masterpiece. Like, he really, actually the word, the actual word masterpiece from the Greek actually means, um, oh, never mind. I didn't write it down, so. But we are God's masterpiece. We're, we, are, we are a work of art to him. He loves us. Even while we were yet sinners, he went after us. I talked a few uh, weeks ago about how Jesus is talking about the woman who loses the coin. How many remember that? The coin had nothing to do with getting lost. The coin was lost because it's an item. It's a mindless item. It got lost. The Bible says we were born into sin because of Adam's sin. Genetically, we are sinners. It's in us. And so we don't have a choice. We're lost at birth. We're lost. We're separated from God. But the woman looked for the coin. Why? Because it has value. The woman tossed up. She looked under the furniture and she searched the whole house until she found the, the coin because the coin had value to her. In the same way, Sinners have value to God. If you have never known God, if you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to know this. You're valuable to him. And you have no value, just like this coin has no value apart from the owner, you have no value apart from the Father because he has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for you. Amen? Amen. And so God wants us to... uh, Come with expectation. So I want to just give you one more verse here, and then we're going to, we're going to have some time of prayer. And this is uh, in Mark chapter 4. And it's when Jesus is going over to the other side. He's going across the lake with his disciples, and how many know the storm came up, started to stir the waters, and he's sleeping in the boat. You guys know the story, right? And his disciples start panicking, and they're freaking out because they think they're going to die. And Jesus is sleeping on a pillow. I don't know how he's doing it, but he's sleeping, okay? And it says here, verse 38, Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat, and his head was on a cushion. The disciples woke him by shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Look what he says. And Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Silence, be still. And of course, everything went silent. And then he asked them, this is very important, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? So I, I want to share this principle with you. I want you to understand. How many know we go through storms in life? Let me see your hands. And they can take on different forms. It can always look different. It can be illness. It can be just you know, nasty people. It can be your job. It can be all kinds of things. There are storms that come against you. It's persecution, whatever. It's storms. And how many know that Jesus is the living word and he's in your boat with you? It was almost like Jesus expected them to take care of the issue. And he stopped and he said, listen, he said, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Here's a key. If you get this, it can change your life. Whenever anxiety or fear rises in your heart when you're searching, when you're in a situation, you need to build your faith in that area. Because the opposite of faith is fear. So if, if you're really fearful at your job or really fearful about your health or you get afraid, you need to take the word of God and put it in your boat. You have to take a scripture that you can stand on and say, Lord, I thank you, Father, that you've not given me a spirit of fear but love, power, and a sound mind. And I thank you that you've made me a royal priest. So I don't care what other people say about me because you have called me a masterpiece, then you just begin to meditate, which means ponder to yourself, what does God's word say 
about this situation. And the perfect love of God that comes through his word will drive out the fear. Does that make sense? So that'll be a sign. Go home today even and pray and say, Lord, what am I fearful of? And then start to build your faith. But look, and you can do this. You can go to the concordance and you can look up words. Maybe you struggle with a temper. Look up words on anger and how to overcome that. And you can look it up. If you don't know how to use a concordance, you can use Google. Right? Google's a pretty good translator. A uh, concordance needs to get saved, but that's another, another story, right? <laughs> But take the word and put it in. And just as I'm finishing here, when I, was, uh, when I got saved, came back to the Lord, around 19, 20 years of age, God healed me at the altar. I got saved. And I had done it all, a lot of LSD, a lot of drugs. And uh, my mind just didn't, didn't work right. You know, I couldn't think straight. I, couldn't, uh, I could read a passage and forget what I just read. Like, it was awful. And I uh, couldn't keep my thoughts, couldn't remember anybody's name. It was just an awful place to be. It was like, and it was my fault. I, I did that to myself. So, but the Lord, in his mercy, healed me. And I was like totally clear-minded. I was like, yeah, God is awesome. Woo! Right? And two years later, I decided to, I was in school to be a machinist. I had done my apprenticeship, and the Lord spoke to me. So you're going to go into the ministry. So I, two weeks before I finished my schooling, I dropped out which was probably a stupid thing. But anyway, I left and went into the ministry, went into the Bible school. And as soon as I joined Bible school, this, this, all this mental stuff came back on me for the first year. And I was just like, what's going on? And so I chose in myself, I said, I'm going to take a scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but love, power. And the Amplified Bible says, A well-disciplined mind. And for probably about a year, every morning I got up and I said, God, I said, you know what? You have not given me a spirit of fear, but a love power and a well-disciplined mind. And I just believe you, God, that, you know, in your timing, this thing's going to break. It's going to go. It has to go. It's not from you. And I kept doing that. I remember my prayers. I mean, God, you got to, you, you know, I'm believing you for this. Because if I'm going to get up and preach, you call me to preach. And if you look stupid, it's not my fault. It's because I've asked you to heal me. I had these kind of conversations, right? Because I, I was just being real with God. I'm like, hey, God, I, you'll look bad if you don't heal me, you know, because I'm doing it, you know. And uh, so, uh, but I stood on the word. I just stood on the word. I stood on the word. And one day, it just phew, lifted off me. And I've been free ever since. Because we have to come with the spirit of expectation. God has promised he's a healer. He didn't say he's going to heal you instantaneous, but he's promised you're a healer. So just keep holding fast to his promises. Don't let go. Let your words line up with his words. And watch what he'll do. Amen? So I want to encourage you today with a little homework assignment. I want to leave you with something to take home. As you go, um, in prayer, say, Lord, what, what causes anxiety? What causes fear in my life? And then he'll show you. He probably doesn't have to because you know what it is. And then you just start getting in the Word and watch how you reprogram the way you think and you'll have faith in that area. Faith for your marriage. Faith for your finances. Faith for your kid's salvation. Whatever it is. Some of you have to take the Word of God and you have to pray it and say, God, I thank you, Father. Your Word says, me and my household shall be saved. And I'm just declaring that you know, they're going to come in, that you're going to protect them, that you're going to go with them. My parents used to pray that. God, go with them wherever he goes. And I would go to the bar, and I'd be sitting at the bar, and I'd, and I'd be like, go away, God. Leave me alone. I don't, and I'd be walking around. People were looking at me like, you're a nut. But I felt like there was like the spirit following me all the time, making me feel bad about everything I was doing. Because I had parents that believed, hey, God, you're going to go with them. So start exercising your faith. Say, I'm going to exercise my faith. And I believe God for good things. In Jesus' name.